<laughs> Absolutely. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, I am Sir Sun Jiang. I am the newest knight of Ontario as of a year and a half almost ago at this point, whatever. Time really means nothing. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking about great weapons. This is an introductory class. So, if you're an experienced great weapon fighter like Jaime, um, this might be quite boring. Now, Jaime, I'll be happy to get your uh, criticism about the things I say. Um, I'm going to cover a lot of the basic stuff that I feel great weapon fighters learn through brutality. You know, you go to your practice, like, oh yeah, I'm going to fight great weapon, and you got, you read the ABCs, and you go to do something, and you get beaten on, and occasionally you beat other people until you start learning stuff. And so I'm trying to get through some of that nuts and bolts before we get to that. Um, uh, if you need a QR code, there's a QR code there. There's a link to it in chat. And I, I'm, you can all, you can actually go to the presentation and comment on it. If your jerk faces, I will just delete your comment or not do anything about it. <clears throat> all right, so I'm gonna cover some of the basics, the ABCs and the basic standards of stuff. Um, I'm basing this off of Corpora and uh, on tiers. Um, I've got links to them. On tiers, ABCs are wonky to get to. So deal with it as you may. Haft is a, let me get my thing, example, as I can reach. All right, so we've got the haft or the handle of a great weapon. Uh, has to be at least an inch and a quarter wide. Great weapon is classified by four feet to seven and a half feet, less than six pounds. You're going to have the ability to put thrusting tips on these equal to the size of the haft or greater. And they have to have an inch and a half of give or more. Um, and that's progressive give. So if you're, if you're, like I'll show you, the, this one's pretty good. Like I can push on this and it's pretty good. Um, this other one that I have is a little bit tired. And so this one right here is too mushy. It's, it's been sort of sitting on it for a while. And it's just, it's a big marshmallow. So it's not, this would not be passed by a marshal, um, but it's got enough space that if it was in fact good foam, it would work. Uh, so that's the basics of it. Um, you can't have a, a smashy and a hitty thing on both ends. So you cannot do bow stuff or fantasy glaive where you've got the stick with two blades on either side. Can't do that. Um, so those are the general aspects of it. Uh, again, if you've got more specifications, you need to talk to your kingdom or your local marshals to make sure you're in guidelines within your kingdom. Because um, things are things vary depending on where you go. Gauntlet. So uh, I've got some I've got a wide variety of gauntlets. I'm going to show these. And I got an opinion here. So part of this, there'll be an opinion. Uh, these are my gauntlets that I've got here. These are Kyle Harris spring steel gauntlets. They're light, they're really articulated. They've got a good thumb. They have, these are called grounding sides so that if I'm holding a weapon, it's hard to see. If I'm holding a weapon and I get hit on the pan, the metal plates are gonna hit the haft before any sort of, of the, impact actually goes to my hand. So these are mine, that's what I use. These are medium price, They're around 500 bucks now, I think. Um, very high quality. Um, I'm, I'm gonna show you the, these are my ladies. Uh, these are Gretter, uh, Gretters. These are the gold standard. If you can get Gretters, good on you. His quote is uh, cheaper than a trip to the emergency room, which is the truth. So uh, this is what all the ACL or this is what a lot of the ACL fighters use because they're literally getting smashed to death. Before I had my uh, my gauntlets, I was using some eggs. These are plastic gauntlets, and they work fine. Um, I've done a modification to them. I put this plate here um, because what was happening, they've got a floating thumb on these, so I would get hit. I get hit on the end of my thumb, and it would jam my thumb in. So I put this plate on there to do that. Um, other than that, they're fine. They deal with their, their impacts just fine. Uh, no, there are no limits on the thrusting tips. We'll talk about that in a second too, actually. Um, here's the opinion part. This is legal armor. It looks like trash, first of all. That's beside the point. I played hockey in college, and these are very good for hockey. They are not great for what we do. Um, if you're doing spear work, like uh, just nine foot spear work, they're fine. But they don't ground. And so impacts can actually smash your fingers and the tip of the fingers have no protection. 
And so the chance of you getting a major issue with your finger are pretty high. And I, I really want to emphasize that it can be an issue. You can do stuff with these and make it work out well. My first pair of gauntlets was a pair of lacrosse gloves that I made a uh, wax hardened leather shell around and they were gigantic, but they worked. You know, they, they were fine. I didn't get, I didn't really get hurt. They had a similar thumb thing to what I had the egg, but they were, they were fine. Hockey gloves have that thumb thing too. They've got a large bone here and it's meant for it. These are meant for hockey, which means they are meant for being in this position. They don't do good when they're in this position because this is all exposed. They're not meant for this. Uh, so that's my opinion. I know there are lots of people that go, oh, I've been fine. I've bought these all forever. Cool. Don't confuse luck with protection. Just because it hasn't happened to you doesn't mean it doesn't happen to other people. Um, and not that it's not going to happen. Uh, same thing's available if you get um, gauntlets or finger gauntlets. You can get ones that are just plates on the top. And if you put your quarter inch of padding underneath them, you are in minimals. You are meeting standard. You're okay. I don't think that's a safe bet for you. That's a great way to lose the ability to use these for extended periods of time or longer. That's me. That's my opinion portion. This is the legal right here as far as what's printed in the books. All right. Um, there's a quick question. There's a thing about thrusting tips. Um, you can have a thrusting tip on both sides. So, um, for example, this spear here has a butt spike and a thrusting tip. By contrast, my bastard sword has a thrusting tip, but none here. And that's because I've got a butt cap on here. Um, and I've got some weights in here, some counterweights, actually. Um, if you've got something like this at the end, you can't use it as, as a secondary strike. So even if I taped up a whole bunch of foam and put it on there, still can't use it. Not allowed. Additionally, this one has a pipe cap back here. Same idea, it's a weight. You can't just put a bunch of stuff on it and say, oh, it's okay. No, don't do that. Uh, also, no butt spikes on, on uh, the hilt and no murder strikes. This is not allowed, no murder striking people. If you wanna do that, you have to get a war, make a war hammer. All right, so continuing with our gear, um, some stuff about uh, other gear you're gonna need. Uh, a great weapon fighter, you've gotta be able to move. So that means you need good footwear. Um, I know a lot of fighters fight in like work boots. Um, they, like, they like their steel toes. I don't know why, it puts a lot of extra weight on your toes for any particular reason. Um, I am a small person, people step on my feet all the time. I'm okay. I happen to use uh, these boots right here. These are uh, military minimal boots and uh, they come in different, a couple different military colors. So they camouflage real nicely as uh, period shoes, but also providing good traction because they've got like a, a Vibram sole um, and they've got high ankle support. So they've got a lot of those things. If you're running around in big work boots, you're not gonna be able to move real well. You need to be athletic to be a good, great weapon fighter. And you can get period shoes that are also going to work very well for this. But think about your footwear. They are part of your gear, possibly the most vital part of your gear. Hip shots or falls. So uh, you're going to get hit in the hip hard. And if you do not have padding and or plates there, you're going to be displeased. If you are a larger person and you've got a lot of extra body mass, it may not bother you quite as much. I don't have a lot of extra body mass. And so when I get hit on the hip, it's on the bones. Um, you don't have, your hip does not have a lot of extra meat. Hold on, camera angle. Your hip right here does not have a lot of extra meat. It's a, it's a pointer. And so you don't have a lot there to take away the thing of a shot. And if you're fighting other great weapon fighters, that is one of our targets. So I recommend a fault of some kind. It can just be a couple extra layers of fabric to sort of take out that little bite. Um, it could be lamellar plates. It could be a piece of pickle barrel underneath your pants, like inside your pants so people can't see it. A couple pieces of leather, whatever. Just something to take it off. And then for spalders, for me, I don't get hit on the shoulders very often. I've had shoulder armor, some lamellar shoulder armor before. Eh, it's up to you. I recommend some padding, but other than that, uh, it's, you know, whatever. Um, you're going to be doing a lot more reaching above your head with both arms. And so if you've got sometimes shoulder armor, it's okay if you do one, but if you do both, all of a sudden you're stabbing yourself in the neck with your with your spalder. So just something to consider. 
um, and consider modifying to work with what you need. No one's going to make fun of you here, probably. I mean, they might. Actually, that's not true. You're going to make you're going to get made fun of in Ontario, so that's legit. I don't know what they're making fun of you for, though. Other than don't have. Yeah. Tell them tell them you're tougher than their shots are. Tell them they have to hit you in the shoulder first. And again, that's it's it's up to you. You know, up to you. Whatever whatever you feel like needing. Uh, and you may find, oh, actually, I did want a little bit on. That. Who knows? Uh, there's also a cool look. You could do one just on one shoulder. So, like if your if your bottom mm -hmm. arm is down here, sometimes that shoulder is covered. Um, right. That's actually visible in some styles of armor. All right. Um, oh yeah, this is a this is the tail end of of equipment here. Mm. When you're picking your weapon or you're making your weapon, so we're starting to fall sort of outside the ABCs here. We're talking about more the the details of what we're doing. You need to think about what you're doing with your weapon and how you're going to be using it. If you are a big person, if you're a power lifter and weight is a non-issue for you, go ahead, do whatever you need to do or whatever you feel, whatever feels right. You may find if you're a, like a power lifter that if you have a very light stick, something that's a little bit, uh, has less mass to it, you go to swing it, you're going to get a flex much like this. This is uh, Duke Tiernan Delkai, and he is not a power lifter. He's actually a little bigger than me. Um, but he's, it's an axe, and so he's got an axe head at the end of it, and he's swinging it with his hands near the bottom of a seven and a half foot stick. They're probably within a, maybe a one foot grip. So what happens is you're gonna get a lot of torque and that, that haft is gonna bend, it's gonna flex for you. And so you have to be able to figure out how to time it so that you hit the target, like he would top it, stop the swing somewhere around here and let the head just come around and whip. Um, because if you were to continue to drive with it all the way through, the head will never actually meet its maximum acceleration. Uh, again, if you're a heavy, if you're a power lifter and, and you, you, you're real to, able to put a lot of energy into a shot, um, a real flexible sh uh, stick is not going to work for you because you're going to swing it and it's going to be, the head's going to be back behind you while your hands are through the target. So you've got to sort of find the right device for you, the right tool for the job. Flexibility, thickness, weight, they're all different things to consider. And the six pound weight limit is not to be trifled with. I want you to understand how heavy six pounds is. I've weighed all my weapons. So I've weighed all, all of my weapons. These are all weapons of myself or my ladies. Um, and so we've got long swords. These are both like two pounds, two and a half pounds. Um, and these are with counterweights and stuff like that. These are four feet long. Um, this is a six foot spear. It's a it's like a pound and a half. It's basically a piece of rattan with tape on it. Um, and this one is a very, it's a whippy sit. It has, it has flex to it and bounce. Um, this mall is like three and a, I think it was three and a half pounds, three or three and a half pounds. And all the weights up here in the head. So they've got different purposes. These are both very short. This is like five and a half feet long. Um, this one right here is three and a half pounds and all of the, all the weights up here on the head of the halberd. It's just foam with some rattan, with a rattan clacker, but it's gonna flex a lot more. Like you can see the half flexing some um, when you swing based on where the mass is. So it's about figuring out what the tool is that you need for whatever job it is. Additionally, depending on what, what event you're doing, you're gonna find uh, some things are unviable. So um, a lot of tournaments, they have a six foot regulation. Um, you might have a melee where the bat, where the battle is a six foot weapon or under. And so you've got to like, that's why I have so many different options because you want choices. On the taped uh, glaive that you have on the fence there, you have the duct tape going horizontal. Yes. What's the difference between being horizontal versus being vertical? Does it help with stability or is it just your preference? Uh, there's some preferences here with this one. There. Okay. So, um, the duct tape is going this way across the face. Um, if the duct tape was going this way, it actually doesn't have as much to hold on to. There's some structural aspects of the straight, the tape going along the face this way. Um, if the tape was just going this way, uh, the, the tape doesn't have a lot to hold on to. It also won't, it won't wrap around this very well. Um, so there's some of that. I think that Mike was talking about. It's I was asking thing. more about the, uh, the weapon um, second from the right. This one? Yes. 
the tape is actually wrapped around it, spiraled. It's like okay. one piece of tape that goes around it. Um, and that's because that's a structural thing for this one, especially. This is, um, this is a laminated weapon. Um, it's got a piece of, of foam in here, and then there's a clacker or a half piece of rattan, rather. Um, but there's a piece of foam in here, so it's, it's, there's a layer that has to hold, basically hold it all together. Okay. So, yeah, no, that's a fine question. Those are fine questions. There's a lot of information on different weapons, whether it's how to make a, a split rattan spear. Um, sorry, camera. There's, there's split rattan. This is a split. There's an opening right here. Um, or the laminated ones. Um, and there's different materials. Um, this right here is a kneeling board. Uh, it's a it's a foam. It's got some give to it, but it's pretty close to architectural uh, foam as far as firmness. And so this is really good for crafting. Like if you want to do like a head like this thing, um, or uh, like a some sort of a fancier shape. This stuff works really well for because it, it cuts real nicely. Um, my axe here is actually made out of the base of a road pylon. Um, I happen to have cut a bunch of holes in it to reduce some of the weight, but also the Chinese did this anyhow, so that was a thing. Um, and then this mall is actually a yoga block. Um, whenever you're using the foam on there, you're going to want a clacker. Otherwise, when you, especially in melee, people get sort of knocked around, and just getting knocked around by one more thing doesn't necessarily register as a, as a hit, but that rattan sound of the clacker will um, will make that registration appear or go in someone's head sometimes, most of the time, hopefully all the time. The basics of it. So there, there's some different things you have to know about great weapons. And a lot of these are both about the weapons and yourself. All right. Um, so different weapons have different strengths. They've got different ranges. If they're a long weapon like this split rattan spear that I have. It's, it's a long weapon. It's a seven and a half foot. But it doesn't have a lot of striking surface. And so it's really good at long range. It's really crappy when it gets in, in tight. My long sword is not a long range weapon. There are many fighters in our kingdom who can reach me with a one handed sword when I am fully extended with my bastard sword because I am short. It's fast for me. It's faster than their sword for the most part. And then there's medium weapons that kind of do a lot of everything pretty well. So it's about finding where those parts, those, those strong parts are and those weak parts are too. Uh, they've also got weaknesses. So the long one's cumbersome. Medium one is jack of all trades, master of none. And then the short one, obviously I'm in range for everybody else. If you are a very fast fighter, like you're short, you like to jump around and stuff, um, those longer weapons are gonna be too cumbersome for you, right? Um, it doesn't mean you can't use them, it's that, it may not be the most effective thing. Um, and along those same notions, like if I'm fighting in a war with a seven and a half foot spear, my seven and a half foot spear has a reach of about nine feet. That means someone else with a spear of, or a glaive of seven and a half feet probably has a reach of nine and a half feet or more, maybe 10 feet on me, just because I'm not very small, very tall. And so I don't actually have that bonus range that I, some other person might have. Okay, and so just something to consider. Also, by the way, I'm not talking about pikes at all. I'm not talking about nine footers. I'm talking about seven foot, seven and a half and under, just to clear that. And yes, we are smaller targets, which makes us more interesting to a lot of people. Some people's arms are, you know, uh, Sir Michael the Tall, who doesn't live in Ontario anymore, is a giant. He's like seven foot or something crazy. And I'm sure that I would have trouble touching him with my spear if I was using my six foot plus spear, if he just stuck his arm out, like I was like a kindergartner trying to run at him. Um, so yeah. <laughs> um, so let's, let's start talking about some of the ethics and the ideology behind um, great weapons. So I put, this in, I put this one in here today, as far as a thing. So great weapons, rightly or wrongly, have a bad reputation as being a less honorable weapon than others. We can't do anything about people's perception as they come in. All we can do is hope to change their perception as they leave. And so there's a bunch of stuff we can do about that, about how we fight and how we approach the game with our weapons that can put us in a good light. Right? And this is really key because it's, for lack of a better phrasing, 
it's really easy for us to be dicks, all right? And there's ways to mitigate that. And rule one is don't be a jerk, or however you want to phrase it. How to fight with a great weapon. So these are gonna, we're gonna go through this kind of quick. There will be, I'll do a couple practice strikes so you can kind of see what I'm talking about and a couple other things. Control over power. Targeting striking is what we're gonna cover. We're gonna cover footwork, we're gonna cover, cover range, and we're gonna cover fear, deception, right? So part of this also, you need to understand that you can either attack or defend, you can't do both until you get better. Once you get better, you can actually do both. But when you are first starting, you don't get to choose. You are either gonna be blocking something or you're gonna be trying to hit something. You don't get to do a blocking strike because you're not there yet. Um, defensive mechanisms that we have are range, fear, and deception. Um, there's a uh, argument that people aren't afraid of great weapons. That is BS. They just have pictured, they have the idea of what fear is in a different aspect. Um, most of the time when you see a newer fighter, sword and shield fighter fighting a great weapon fighter, their first reaction is to run at that person as fast as they can. And that, they run at that person because of fear. They can't reach them. They're getting hit in the shield. It's making a loud noise. They dislike that. Those are all things that create fear. So we want to use that to a certain extent as part of our defensive mechanisms. Um, and then there's range. Our weapons are longer, generally, to allow us to give us a little more space to do things. And then deception. Those are tricky stuff. Tricky stuff comes later, too. But we can use some of that here. All right, so footwork. Um, I'm going to show a couple basic footwork things. Um, but you really need to go look at Duke Mark. There is nobody that can hold a, hold a candle to Duke Mark. If you want to see great long sword fighting, two-handed sword fighting, watch the video of Duke Mark versus Duke Miles. I think, I don't know. They may not have been Dukes at the time. Um, fighting for the West Crown. This was uh, six, seven years ago, I think. And Duke Mark is, it's, crazy because neither one of those guys are to be slighted um so if you want to know more about footwork duke marked up this huge channel go check out his stuff when we're talking about footwork mainly what we're talking about we're talking about balance and balance is getting yourself on the balls of your feet being active um if you've played baseball it's the same idea if you're in the batter's box you've got to be on your balls of your feet ready to go to hit the ball same idea here same as with any other sport you've got to be ready to go now with great weapons we have to be able to move in all directions we have to be able to move forward at the camp we have to be able to move back forth and in turns um it's not to say that you're not going to be doing something like running straight backwards but Typically, when you run straight backwards, you actually don't gain as much ground as you want. Um, so generally, when you talk about things like going backwards, we talk about a uh, J step. And so you take your foot and you go in a J, you go to the sideways like this. Um, so you might do like this and slide around and get someone to go past you and hit them. But more often, you're just gonna be running away. And that's fine. When you run away, most attackers, give up because they're lazy. After a few strides, they might go two or three at you and then sort of slow down and give up. If you are good and fast, if they can catch you, they'll keep going. So as you go, if you're able to go at a slight curl, you cre can create space that might not otherwise be there. Um, if it's a right-handed attacker, so their sword's over here on my left, if they're coming at me, if, I, if I'm running backwards this way, I'm creating extra distance so their arm, as they swing, I'm going away from where their sword is. But as I do those sort of retreats, I've got to stay balanced. If I am upright trying to run backwards, I'm going to fall. I'm going to trip. And I also can't do anything except for run backwards. If I'm balanced and I'm running backwards, I can stop 
and countercharge them. Okay. I can also, as I'm running backwards, I could be hitting them because I'm low and I'm in balance. So that's where that footwork really comes in. Part of that is getting your body lower, bending at the knees, and just getting used to running on your the balls of your feet. This is again where that those work boots become problematic. Uh, they've got those huge chunky heels, and those huge chunky heels force you to land on your heels more often. When you do that, you're going to be well, you're not going to be you're not going to put your balance on the balls of your feet. You're going to put your ball balance back a little ways. Yeah, I have links to uh, Duke Mark's channel uh, at the end of the slideshow, um, as well as a couple other things too. Oh, real quick, and on the retreat, there was somebody in the, we have a, there's a great weapon forum in, uh, in Facebook, and someone was talking about, well, we don't run backwards and hit people. Well, there's other ways to do it, but honestly, you're gonna run backwards, you're gonna have to hit people while you're running backwards, because um, it's just how it works. All right, so, um, Basic strike. So I've got again videos at the end. Uh, Duke Tamuki has these real good videos from uh, a couple events. These are years ago, um, eight, ten years ago, and he shows a bunch of basic and intermediate level strikes. And honestly, if you can do these strikes, you're going to find great success in the long sense of, of the game. Um, and everything else becomes sort of like frosting. It's like, you know, if, if you can, if you can't throw a flat snap. You're going to have a heck of a time being really successful at doing most things in the, in sword and shield fighting. So I'm going to show you talk about the where kind of we target at in general. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the ice cream scoop, which is a Tamuki strike, two axis thrusting, butt spikes, and how to not strike with the butt spike. So it's all right. So hopefully my dog will not try to play with me very much. Um, what we going to use for this one? I'll use this one. We use my axe. Okay, so my axe has a butt spike. It's got, um, it doesn't actually have a thrusting here, but I'll use this to thrust at it. Um, striking surface here. Uh, it doesn't have a striking surface here. Technically, if you get hit in the face with a lot of stuff, you're going to be real sad. All right, so when you talk about angle of strike, uh, when you're doing a flat snap, you're taught to do a flat snap at the side of the head, right? And that's because you're doing a rotation in this fashion. Well, with great weapons, you can do that strike. Um, but what's typically found more successful is if you aim for the neck. So if I do a flat snap, it's this strike. But if I aim at the neck, I go like downward, diagonal. Now, if I do a flat snap motion and they duck it, my weapon goes through. This has got a lot of mass, it's gonna carry through. And now I'm out of position. But if I throw diagonal, if they block it, cool. If they duck it, I still hit them in the, in the head. If they try to move away from it, I might still hit them in the shoulder. All of those are kills with a great weapon. So aiming for the neck in this strike, it gives you a lot of options. Uh, Tamuki teaches a strike called ice cream scoop, and it's you start high, and as you come in, you're coming in down like this, and then you turn it. But you turn it by taking your back hand and lifting it up, rotating off of your front hand. So it's and again, that's that general idea of well, if they decide to block it, well, if they use a sword block on it, when you're coming down this way, you're gonna hit their sword and you're gonna drive that out of the way and then turn it into the side of their head. So that's the, the notion of that. So your next thing on there is the rusting strike, I believe. If you switch to this. Nope, I'm gonna stick with this one. Um, so I'm gonna turn this around and do a thrust. So um, when we thrust, uh, especially as a newer fighter, you're thinking it's like a full cue and you're just losing your top grip and you just try to and poke, poke. And this is true, this works, but it's very obvious where you're throwing your shot at. And that's because you've got one point of, of movement. So, oh, I'm gonna go high, I go low with this. I'm gonna go low. Where if you're taken and think about the fact you've got two hands, you can make your shot curl around stuff around. So if I'm throwing at the camera here, so a straight shot might look like this. Where if I curl it, I can do this type of thing where I can make the blade, the point spin around stuff. 
you can learn to scoop underneath things. You can dive underneath it. And so those are just a matter of practicing some different notions. There's a, a Sikh martial artist who has some really good videos on how to do that. Like he shows it, but it's like a 35 second clip within this longer video. Um, but you, you, know, you talk to your local knights about how to spear, how to use the spear work, and they should be pretty helpful about how to really get better point thrust technique. Hi, Bixie. Yes, I see you. Settle down. Settle. Anyhow, um, go inside. Good girl. All right, so um, last one for the butt spikes, or not striking with the butt spike. Um, yeah, go in, great. Okay, good. So um, a common thing that people do with the butt spike is like, oh, I want to push them in the head with my butt spike. And so they go up like this and hit them. This is an illegal strike. You're not allowed to do that. You have to go here and hit them. It's got to be straight on. So if you're hitting them at an angle like this, that doesn't count. You have to bring it up and then pop. And it has to be significant. Now, um, there's a, uh, this is an opinion piece for me as well. The butt spike, I will only let someone take the butt spike if I hit them in the face, the neck, or the groin. Maybe the armpit if I'm like really low and I get underneath them or something. But butt spikes are like, they're to keep your spear from getting wrecked when it stomps in the mud. They're not typically actually that sharp. They're, ma they're mass objects. So if you're to hit someone in armor, it's not going to do that much. Um, I have actually hit someone with the pommel of my bastard sword many times by accident, and he did not die. So I was fighting a knight. I got inside. I was going to go drop the blade like this. My pommel got hooked on his chain. And so it went and hooked here and swung down. And I pommel striked him in the chest three times. And he's like, you don't have a, a butt spike there. And I was apologetic because I was still trying to figure out why my sword was not hitting him in the face like I wanted it to. So that's my opinion. If you can convince somebody to take your shot when you butt spike them in the chest, you probably hit them possibly a little excessive. Possibly. Depends. Or you just sold it real well. That's good too. Okay, so here's some general aspects about how to manage yourself in a fight. Um, so when it comes to range, so weapon ranges vary. We talked about that a little bit with the different size weapons. Um, and you can maintain range in different ways. One of those ways is by understanding your footwork and creating space. When I fight with my uh, bachelor sword, this is one of my, this is one of my preferred, probably my most preferred weapon as far as how to fight. I will fight in this position most often. Okay, I'm not here, I'm here. And what that means is from here, from this pose, I can reach the pel that's all the way from there if I extend. Range if I want. But from here, I'm more defended and I'm controlling the space. And I might throw this out and pop their shield once in a while, but I'm not gonna like, leave. if I leave this out there, I don't actually have range because the space between my, my weapon and them is very small. As soon as they control their weapon, my weapon, they control me. So by doing this, keeping myself in tight, I can, create a, I can create some space. I can create a distance that they then have to come across. They have to get to me. Even from there, a very tall fighter who throws a flat snap, I can block it. I've got a lot of time to read their shot. A half, a half a lean back and I'm out of range of a lot of stuff. If I take a step, all of a sudden I've got a ton of room. So that's all the sort of things about uh, understanding range. And again, if you look at Duke Mark um, and look at his videos, you'll see how to create range with footwork. He is all about that. All right, we talked about uh, running backwards, curling away from your opponent's weapon. That was that uh, right-handed person throwing over here. So as you step, you step to your right. So that makes you curl away from them. Um, and then also learning to strike while retreating. I, I mentioned that um, being on the balls of your feet, 
your strikes don't have to be killing strikes. They can be attention getting strikes. And we'll talk about this more with the fear and deception thing too. Um, and then also knowing your footing and what's around you. We'll talk about that in, air, in the tourney stuff, but basically if you're fighting in a tournament, you've got to know your Eric so that you don't run into the rope. Running into the rope is a jerk move. Um, happens once in a while, it's fine. But if it happens more than once in a while, you're just bad. So don't do it. Okay, so fear. Um, we have to use fear because we don't have other options. We have range and we have the weapon in our hand. Fortunately, our, the weapon in our hand creates fear. Um, going back to the thing about wrongly or rightly, people don't like great weapons. They think they're unchivalrous. And that's because a lot of time you get a big guy who's like, well, I'm kind of slow, but I'm pretty strong. And they go, okay, I got this. And somebody's coming at them and they just beat at them horrendously. They don't ever move their feet, but they're just beating on something with massive great weapons, just clubbing them. And um, that creates a sense of fear, creates an ethic of fear. Um, but even as a shorter fighter, you can make somebody like unsure. I do a lot of, I, I make myself smaller and I give them the sense that like, they're not sure what's going to happen. And that's uncertainty creates a fear. You know, if you can thrust at them, even if you're just hitting their shield, you're creating this idea that as they, they're going to get hit. Like, oh, I got to protect against that. If you watch a newer fighter fighting a great weapon fighter, and, they, and the great weapon fighter blasts the shield, that shield inches up higher and higher to cover the person's head because the shield man does not want to get hit by that. So how do we use that? Well, you blast him in the shield and then you shoot him in the hip. You know, so if I'm fighting a shield man, and we've got this big shield here, if I go, if I wind up back here and I just blast their shield, their shield will come up. They'll go, oh my God, I don't want to hit him like that. I don't care how experienced the fighter is. They will suck it up. So you go, boom. And you'll note, like I rolled away from where their sword is. So I'm here, and then I'm here, and I scoop down, and I blast them in the hip. And they're going to die. If they don't, I'm still safe. I'm out here. I'm good. So that, that's, again, that's how you use fear. That's an example of how you use fear. There are other ways. You can be thrusting at somebody's head and they'll come up and block higher and higher. And then you could do a fake thrust and then drop the tip down and hit him in the belly, that type of stuff too. Okay, let me read that question here. As a short person wanting to get into fighting great weapons, is it a lot harder than sword and board than to learn control? Um, I started wanting to do just great weapon fighting and they, um, Ontario has, has a tradition of sword and board fighting. And so they're like, well, you should learn sword and board fighting at least to know how to fight against them. I find, and this comes into the next part, the deception part, um, uh, Jeresa, right? Jeresa. Um, and, and we'll I'll talk about the deception about how to um, control. Is the control you're talking about power control or is it fight control? Let me let me take, let me get through deception, and I'll talk about both those things. There's a, there's a quote from Sun Tzu from the Art of War. It's a translation, obviously. Um, but up here, weak where you're strong and strong where you're weak. So let's go back to the different weapons here. So if I'm fighting with dog came out. Yep, there it is. Good, got it. If I'm fighting with a seven foot weapon, seven and a half foot weapon. All right, so I am strong at range, but I am weak if they're, they come in close. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present like I'm strong when I'm up close, like here, and I might be just like ready, not putting tip on them, not presenting the thrusting tip, but presenting it like this. And I can still put it on them real quickly. But I'm saying here, I'm here, I'm ready to strike you if you come in. Um, additionally, if I was fighting with a shorter weapon, okay, well, I'm weak here. But I will let them know like, hey, yeah, I'm weak at range. I can't reach you, but oh, guess what? I can reach you from here. I've got, I can actually get range. You wanna watch that, be careful. I can touch you still. Don't let me touch you. 
And then they have to calculate again about what it is. So as a smaller fighter, I will do things like I'll get smaller still. I might have a team. I'm five five. So if I'm in my if I'm in my standard fighting position, I might be here somewhere close to, I don't know, five foot ish. You know, I drop a little bit, but I might get low. So if I'm down here, they now have to look down at me for the most part. Most people, when they look down, they do this. And so you can use that. You can be down here and then pop them in the head. You just extend your arms up and come across. As a smaller fighter, and this is something, again, I feel bigger fighters actually have a harder time with. Bigger fighters, they can use their arms. They go, okay, I'm going to hit this. And they're using their arms a lot because they can't. Great weapon fighting is not about your arms. Your arms, actually all the fighting is, but none of the fighting is about your arms. Um, your arms are your steering wheel. They control your aiming, your targeting. Your power comes from your core. Um, if I'm going to strike here, I don't have to extend my arms at all to, all to hit that hell really hard. Okay, I can take this, I can throw, throw an offside with my left hand. If I can hit the pell, sorry. That's not my arm doing it. That's right off my hip. So those types of strikes are from your core. You're going to get that core power by being lower. Um, and, and again, the great thing with great weapons is that because you have two hands on them, you could put your body into it a little bit more easily sometimes. Um, as a shorter fighter, I, gotta, I can't read the comments from here, but I'll, I'll read it in a second. Um, as a shorter fighter, the key you have to get is your power has to come from here. As a smaller fighter, we don't get to cheat and go, I'm going to use my arms and just blah, blah. I've got crap form. I can hit somebody real hard with my arms. We don't get that. We have to do it right. We have to do it right every time. And because of that, it means we actually have to learn great technique to be good. So getting yourself down low is going to help you with that. It also helps you because from here, if I'm on the balls of my feet, my stride from here, I can go this far forward. I can go equal distance back because I'm here. I can extend backwards this way. So I've got a lot more to deceive them about where they think I am because I'm here. If I'm up higher, I can only go back this far because I don't have that spring in my legs. Yeah, they stand over me like that all the time. I got real good fighting for my knees, honestly. Um, people would leg me all the time, and I got real good. And one of the things I do is, I don't have my sword, not on my sword board out here, but I do have a sword. But. So imagine this is my shield. I would be here on my knees. I might get like this. And all of a sudden, I'm really small. And so they're trying to look at me, and I'll just go, boop. You know, just right up their shield and just pop them in the face. There's a lot we can do. That's a different different talk, though. Unfortunately, it's not just that. Um, so, I think the answer to your question is yes. Um, it's a different way for you to see the fight, and how you to see range. Okay. So hopefully that helps, and if not, we can talk more after this, or maybe not right after this, but sometime. All right. So those are general tactics for um, fighting with the great weapons. Um, again, these are my interpretations of things. Um, in general, I feel amongst all the things I've ever heard and learned, um, these all kind of, these all basically encapsulate it. And again, we use fear as a tool. We do not use fear as a, as a point of making more fear. So that's that control factor. That's the, I am not going to swing as hard as I can. Uh, there used to be a, a 90 degree rule in Ontario. Um, which is you can't draw back farther than 90 degrees to strike your target. Um, they've changed that. I think it's 180 now or something like that. Um, but the big point is you need to strike under control. Um, you can do a strike with a great weapon that hits plenty hard, plenty hard. It's a three inch strike. Like you're just there and you just tighten your, tighten your core and just snap it. Just like close your hand and you will snap somebody in the head harder than they feel like being touched. So. Trust me, power is not the problem. It's the, how you get to the point where you can put the power into it. Tactics, I'm gonna talk about tourney tactics and I'm gonna talk about melee tactics. 
they are not the same thing. We've got three parts here for this. Um, so knowing the standards of your tournament, uh, again, knowing what they will allow. If they're going to let you go into the seven and a half foot weapon and you're a giant person and you feel like using a seven and a half foot weapon. Cool. Um, I think something any larger than six feet would feel very clumsy in most Eric's. Um, but I'm not you. For me, that's like a six foot weapon is, is a perfectly good size. And seven and a half feeters, footers actually feel pretty lumpy for me for uh, even wars and stuff. But again, know your weapon, do what you need to do. And then know yourself, know what you feel comfortable fighting with. And the idea that someone should tell you uh, what weapon is going to be cool or not is a pile of crap. You do the thing that you love to do. You get good at your thing. Anybody that says you can't use that in attorney, unless there's a rule that says you cannot turn use that thing in the attorney, it just means they cannot use that thing in the attorney. Fighting a bastard sword, maybe it's not recommended. Doesn't mean you can't do it. Fighting with a mall, maybe not the right idea for most people, but you are going to make it happen and you're going to make it look good. For that, that's the world you want, you want to live in. Make your decisions. Know the ground. So uh, Eric's, Eric's come in different sizes. Um, some Eric's are massive. Some Eric's are tiny. You know, if you're fighting in a 10-foot uh, Eric and you're using a seven and a half foot weapon, uh, if you're anywhere near the ropes, you're putting the crowd in danger. So there's that. Um, so a 10-foot Eric is pretty small, by the way. But know whether the ground is wet, whether it's going to be rough, whether there's like lots of gopher holes or things like that. Um, because you need to know how you're going to move. If the ground is really rough and wobbly, running backwards may not be a very good option, honestly. You know, you've got to just make that judgment. Um, if it's wet, well, trying to plant and counter charge, that ain't going to happen. You're going to step and you're going to slide and do the splits. So, so just idea of that. Um, and I mentioned this before, uh, don't run into the ropes. It happens once, it's an accident. It happens twice, it's careless. It happens three times, it's on purpose. Plain and simple. Um, in some in some kingdoms, um, there's actual rule for that. Like if you run into the ropes three times, you forfeit, which is more than enough times. Um, if you are running into the ropes, you're gaming the system because they're they're gonna they call hold when you touch the ropes because you're not supposed to mess up the Eric. Um, and sometimes there's you know metal rope lines and stuff like that. Um, but don't do it. Know where you're at. Um, and that's where that running backwards and turning at the same time, uh, that pays off. Be chivalrous. So in a tournament, um, again, going back to the how people perceive us, um, you've got to make extra efforts to be as chivalrous as possible. If you leg somebody and you stand at your, your maximum range, well out of their striking range and hit them until they give up, basically, you're, you're an asshat. There's no other way to put it. You're looking horrible. You're not giving your opponent any sort of chance to hit you or to compete. You're basically saying, you better concede. I'm just going to keep punching you in the, in the shield, the area, until you finally give up and get tired of holding stuff in that place. If you are fighting another great weapon person, um, again, this is my opinion on this one. So if you arm an opponent that's also a great weapon fighter, if you are at similar skill level, offer to return their arm. Because one-handed great weapon fights look horrible to the crowd. They are craptacular. It's a bunch of flailing. If you both lose arms at the same strike, you should just talk it out and say, like, what if we just don't lose our arms? Because you're going to look bad. There's just no two ways about it. Like once in a while, you'll see a great weapon fighter who can throw their great weapon with one arm in some sort of decent fashion, but it's not very often. If you are a beginning fighter and you arm a knight, offer to them. The knight probably shouldn't take it because they are higher level than you are, or they might take it one time, depending on what kind of tournament it is, who knows. If you leg them, that's a different thing all entirely. And then consider the experience of, of the, yourself as an opponent. Um, would you want to fight, would you want someone to fight you in that same manner that you are fighting? You know, if you earn the advantage of a much better opponent, again, like a knight, you can choose to offer them parity. Be like, hey, I'm going to kneel down and we're going to fight from the knees. Or no. I'm going, to take, I'm going to take my advantage and use it. Again, as a newer fighter, you've earned that advantage. You should probably take that advantage. If I'm fighting another knight, I might either ask them to turn their, their feet or 
um, I might go down with them. It's also one time. Like if you leg them once and you say, all right, go and get back up and you leg them again, that's too bad. They've, they've, lost, they've, they've lost the parity at that point. Uh, same thing with the arms. If you arm them once and they, they let you, you let them, you arm them again, well, they should block that. All right, so um, some basic tactics here. Control the Eric. Uh, don't get cornered. If you get cornered, you're screwed. And thrusts are a very high percentage shot, especially in air. People square up often too close. You can also do things to create that sort of fear that encourages them to charge at you. So let's take a look at that real quick. I'm going to use my Pell as my opponent here. So if I'm at if I'm at range out here, a lot of times people will square up almost in striking resistance. So from here, I can strike them, but they can't strike me. So they were here. And we're looking at each other, you know, if you're a little farther back and it's, you know, bow to your opponent, salute the crown, and you're ready to go. Well, I can start off by owning the Eric by going pop. They block it, great. They don't block it. I hit them in the face. They're dead. So if they do block it, they're going to stagger back a little bit. Or they're going to charge me. It's that fear. It's a pop them in the shield, most of them they're like, ah. When they charge you, especially no, newer fighters, a lot of time they were, they're charging from a place of defense. So they're in cover. They go here, they're behind their shield. They're looking at your feet. Well, if they're charging at me, I can go like this, step over and hit them in the back of the head or the leg. Or I can go here and pop them. Thrusting while they're running at you is not very great typically, but you know, it's, you're here and if I do this and I start them off and they start running at me, okay, cool. They run, they can't see me. I can throw, throw a leg strike. Later on when you get better, you can throw a wrap. You, know? you can throw a wrap at their head as they're running by. All these things are fine. Um, and again, it's creating that range that you want. So those are all different parts of that. Let me show you all this. Um, yeah, the thrusts are super high percentage. Oh, and the double tap. Oh, the double tap. How could I forget double tap? If you don't know this, it's an Ontarian rule. Um, and I don't know why it's not everybody's rule. So you always hit them twice. You know, because if I hit them here, if I go, if I go hip, I'll go hip, face. Or I might go, um, one of the moves I like to do is I'll go in and if I can get them like in a bind somehow, like so we're crossing weapons. If I can lift their weapon up, I might go here and go through their body. And as I step through, I'll, I'll strike I don't have room here. And I'll hit them in the back of the head as a wrap as I go past it. So, you know, I would do if I had an idea. I can do it yeah. So we get a bind. I might go boom, get them up high, and then as I go through that type of thing. So make sure you get it. Make sure they know that they got it. Rule one is cardio, you're right. That's the basics of tourney tactics. Tourney tournaments, you just gotta do it. Why does my name say Roxana Yi? That's cool, who did that? <laughs> I'm real confused. This was my name in, in Zoom. <clears throat> All right, so um, melee. So we're gonna talk about melee here real quick before we sort of conclude. So I made this little graphic. This is basically the wheel of, of, of death in melees. So um, we've got, uh, my neighbor just turned their dog. We've got uh, nine foot spears kill. Sorry, I'm gonna try to move my stuff and I can't see it. There we go, got it, okay. Uh, so nine foot spears kill shields. Shields kill archers. Archers kill spears. Everybody kills great weapons. And once in a while, we get to kill everybody. Um, I can't remember who it is. I saw a video years ago, and it was uh, someone just here giving a sort of impromptu talk. He talks about like you know, in a in a melee, often you will go an entire couple battles and not touch anybody. Like you get you get hit by an archer. Oh, this person piked you. Um, you know, somebody flanks your line and you're dealing with something else, you get tapped in the back of the head, whatever, but you just don't do anything. And then other times, like somebody tries to crash your line and you're like, you're the second row, 
and you just beat the bejeebus out of them, and then you beat bejeebus out of their friends, and then their friend, and then you go over to their house and you take all their stuff. And that's how that goes with great weapons. But a lot of times people are just killing us. I personally have never gone to war with the shield uh, because I am a stupid idea to have in the shield line. I'm too small. I'm too fast, I'm too small. So I'm not effective at anything. Nobody can hide behind me. Within that idea, there's some basic gear prep. So uh, make sure you have the right tool for the job. Um, I normally will, I've, my thing I've been bringing most often in the last, not last year, obviously, but in the last couple of years is my mall. Um, if I'm not running Pike, I'll be running my mall because it's funny. And the funny is a really important thing. But you know, if it's a six foot and under battle, you have to have a six foot spear or under. Honestly, as a great weapon fighter, when they do a six foot and under battle, you should be a god. You should make everybody question their choices in life because you know exactly what you need to do with a six foot weapon. Everyone else, they might kind of know what they're doing, but as a great weapon fighter, you own it. But again, choosing what you want. If you're doing a castle defense, well, the mall is a great weapon for that because if somebody tries running through the, through the wall, I can just, I can do a full swing and hit their shield and stop them. Um, and I can also play whack-a-mole and boop them on the head, which is also fun. But if I'm attacking the castle, the mall is not necessarily the right choice. I'm going to get, you know, I can get hung up in the gate. It's not a bad choice, actually, because it's not very big. A seven and a half footer though, is not a good idea for attacking a castle. Like you can't, you can't attack the walls with a seven and a half foot spear because you can reach them. They've got pipes. You can't make it through the gate. And if you do, you're going to get, you're going to tangle up a bunch of people both in front of you and behind you with your spear. Making the right choice for the thing, for the task is the right thing. Additionally, you want a backup weapon. Let me show you what I mean by a backup weapon. Um, some people use throwing weapons. Um, this here is one of my axes. Um, this is, it's foam, foam head with a clacker on it. I think it's a, it's a piece of leather, black leather. Um, it's real light, but you, you can get like a little metal ring and just drop it through a loop on that, on your belt. Um, you'll see pikemen sometimes will just run it as a, as a loop lanyard and just hang it off their wrist while they're piking and they can just bring it up when they need to. That works okay when you're piking. It doesn't work well when you're great weapon fighting. Um, so there's that. Um, my other weapon, which I just threw to the ground. Um, so this is my backup dagger. I have a, a scabbard for it so I can draw it. Um, this is like a short sword. It is, uh, it has a significant mass to it. I can strike with it and land a plenty fine shot. Um, and it's got a thrusting tip and it's good for thrusting. Um, honestly, a stabbing dagger, a real short little hand dagger is a great backup weapon because at that point, that might be the only thing you get to do. If your weapon is tied up, you, if you can draw your dagger and stab somebody, that works. If you get armed, well, you can't do a lot with one arm in a war. So you got to work with what you got. Pepper. Yeah, stabbing somebody in the face. It's a winner. Everybody wins on that one, except for the person who got stabbed. Side note, if anybody challenges you to do a knife fight ever in SCA, uh, nobody wins in a knife fight. It's just whoever loses first. But you both lose because a knife fight typically ends with somebody getting punched in the face or jacked in the junk. And so it's a losing battle. Unless you're the audience, the audience wins. That's true. All right. Um, real, real broad. Real quick on this one here, just to go through it. Um, but as a great weapon fighter, you are not a frontline unit. You are second line. So you're not the shield wall or the pike one. You're behind them. You are there to deal with people that get through the wall, get into the ranks. Um, if there's a flank, you have to be able to spot that there's a flank coming and address it. And you can stop things. As a great weapon fighter, you have this ridiculous psychological power that nobody else has. If there's a pikeman by themselves, two shieldmen, they'll go, oh, and they just charge them. They split a little wide and they charge them. Done. Great weapon fighter, I have, I, my mighty five and a half feet with a red belt at the time, I could hold off six people just by standing there with a great weapon because they don't know what to do. Again, it's that fear factor. They just don't understand what to do. Um, yeah, you're the best, best thing you can do is be the eyes and the ears. So you're in that second row, you're looking at, you're looking around, you're making calls, you're tapping people over, reinforcements come up, you redirect them to where they need to be, you're helping pikemen find targets, you're helping archers find targets. 
You are an NCO. And that is your job. You're not going to be up there trying to block spears. You might, if like the shield wall gets decimated and it's just you and some spearmen, you can help do some of that defensive stuff. But you know, you've got to work with what you what you have available and, and do that job. Uh, the shield wall can't see anything, so you they need your help to help tell them what to do where to go. Um, the pikemen may be overly focused. There may be a weak spot where you can like move a pikeman over to you and create a huge difference just by moving the weapon. To a different spot and again you can hold off a line like it's a delay they're going to get you they're going to kill you but you could hold if you hold them off for 10 seconds one person gets six you held them off for 60 seconds because each one of those people had to stop and wait for you to figure out how to deal with you you know it's that you're just sitting there with a point waving it around and nobody wants to jump in at you just like an action movie and you look great you look super great and they look stupid because they are by the way, if you're ever attacking a great weapon fighter who's alone, you flank them. You go different directions. You go go to 90 degree flank. So one person this way, one person this way, and then you make them make them choose on who they're attacking because they can't do both. They can attack one or the other. Here are my links. There's Duke Mark's uh, channel. Um, there's a couple of links to a couple of things that he's, that he's got about. Um, I think I think a couple of those are fights of his. I think they're I think one of those is the West Crown fight, and then there's another one that should. Another thing, and the Duke to Mookie ones are all different um, uh, videos of um, camps that he ran, classes he taught. So, any other questions that I can help out with or answer that I did not already answer? So next one, so I can see over the most. How do I, so uh, Eric, you were talking about how do I make it work as a shorter fighter? You mean as a, as a in melee, a second liner? Um, so I'm 5'5", five five. I can still see, like humanity is big, but they're not like, I can see the curvature of the earth. Um, you know, it's uh, if you were real short, if you're five foot, yeah, it might be a problem. But like, um, you know, if if this is where the front line is, if I'm a step back, I can still see. I just stand up more and I go like this. You know, if I stand back a little bit far, I can do my tippy toes. You know, sometimes I might have to jump or whatever, and it might seem silly, but you know, I can still see. Also, the ground is very seldom level. So either I'm looking down at stuff or I'm looking up at stuff. So if it's on an uphill, I'm looking up like, oh, okay, they're over here. Oh, look, those guys go over there. And you can see movement. You can just sort of track movement that the shield line won't be able to. Also, if you're bigger like you, you're a great archery target. They love shooting at you. You've got nothing to block it. The eye, I'm a small archery target, but I wear yellow. So like, oh, look at me, everybody. Shoot me, because I'm not that important in a melee. If they kill me, they kill me. So what? I've got all these pikemen that are doing good work. I've got these shieldmen in charge. I've got some kings and knights and stuff around. And they got they have other things that are important. If they're shooting at me, I'm a small target. I'm a small frame. So the archers want to hit this bright yellow target. And now I've got a white belt. So now they're going to want to hit me even more. I know I'm a knight, but I wasn't before. They still wanted to hit me even before I was a knight. They loved hitting me because I dance. I'll be back there with my great one. I'll just be dancing around as they try to shoot at me. Plus, Jaime, I have a repeating crossbow now. I'll fire it back. Everybody wants to hit the squire. Everybody exactly. Wants. They do. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. Anybody else? Questions? Anything I didn't answer or didn't answer very well? They do want to hit you when you giggle. Back to armor, you were talking mostly about um, shoulder protection, but you didn't go into hips or legs very much. Do you get hit more below the waist in your thigh area, or does mostly everything come to the head, head and shoulders? Um, so it, 
it de it's going to depend. Um, it depends on a number of things. Uh, if I'm fighting with uh, a longer weapon, say I'm fighting with a six foot spear. Well, if I'm fighting with a six foot spear, I can block my. Let me switch cameras. This camera kind of sucks. Um, That's useful. Um, so with my spear, I can block my leg. Where if I'm fighting with my bastard sword, for me to block my leg, I have to go like this, or I've got to, I've got to chop it. So it's going to depend. If I if I do a chop block like this, well, this whole side becomes open. If I'm fighting with a glaive or a spear, I can drop the the butt end down and cut off this side and still have this side of my face blockable. And I can do the same thing over here. Like so, um, I run a splinted pickle barrel. They're, they're two inch wide splints of uh, pickle barrel that are laced together to my leg armor. Um, I run a lamellar craft and I've got a lamellar folds on it too. Um, I get hit depending on who I'm fighting different ways. You know, if I'm fighting a sword and shield, they're trying to get up on me. And so a lot of time they're going for head and shoulders and back. Where if I'm fighting a great weapon, they're, they're aiming more lower down here because if they're shooting up here, I'm doing this stuff. I'm, I'm boxer dodging. Um, and again, one-handed weapons, uh, sword and shield, they're, they're, far, they're too far away. So they've got to, they typically jump right into A range, um, which is, part of the thing because I like a range. Um, so, you know, it's it's learning how your tactics work is part of it and what armor you need for your tactics. Um, I would say the majority of the alleys I get are like shoulder paint on my shoulder blade because they just, they, they jumped me and they're big person is like throwing wraps until they land meat. And they're just going to keep throwing them until the glory happens. Or I, or I do something else. Plus, I'm always I'm down here, so if they jump me, I'm like I get lower, and so they're just, they're reaching down, so I'm trying to roll out of them. So, anything else? Cool. Well, thanks again, everybody, for coming. I was I'm glad as many people involved. Um, uh, the slideshow is available, and uh, again, if you have comments, I'm happy to hear your comments or see comments that you will put on there. No one else can see the comments except for me. Um, and uh, hopefully, stuff will be useful. And I hope that you decide to go into great weapon fighting and that you enjoy it. Um, stay safe, work hard, cardio, rule one, double tap, rule two. <laughs>